he's helping out with that. But we do have an overflow that we use. It's in the fellowship hall directly behind us. We want to make sure to get as many people in this room as possible. And I appreciate your help. Well, let me introduce myself. I'm a Pastor David Beatty, the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. I've pastored this church now for four years, and I took over from my dad, who pastored for 20 years. And we have a long legacy of a church that is faithful to God's Word and uh, doing the right thing. And uh, we praise the Lord for what the Lord's doing through our church in our community. And we're happy to have you here for the Bontrager family as they uh, uh, praise the Lord in song and uplift their own spirits through, uh, through the song as well. So we're going to go ahead and start with a word of prayer. And I'd ask that all of us stand as we go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask Him to bless the time that we have. Dear Lord, I thank you for loving me. And God, I love you. And Lord, we're so thankful that you loved us first. And Lord, as we as a church come together, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to understand the magnificent impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our hearts and lives. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us as a church to understand um, the gravity and the, the weight of the burden that uh, we are to share for our community. Lord, I'm thankful for the folks that showed up this evening, for the Bontrager family. I pray that you'll uh, bless the time that we have. We pray, lo Lord, through the music and the testimonies and the preaching that you would be lifted up and honored. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Thank you for coming out this evening. There's about four or five seats left in the front here. If some of you want to move up here, you're welcome to do so. We do not want you to come uh, for another entertainment show. This is not about entertainment. This is 100% about lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And any time throughout the evening service you want to sing along with us, by all means, feel free to do so. And we want to give God the honor and glory and our praise this evening. Let's worship together. <laughs> Pavilion in splendor and girded with 
we see some familiar faces. We were here, I think it was around a year ago this time. We're the Bontrager family from Iowa. And I got an invitation to go down to South Carolina and help in a prison revival. So we packed up our clan, which I think numbered about seven or eight at the time. And the first night in prison, I remember asking the men for a raise of hands. I said, how many of you are fathers? And almost every hand in the room went up. And when I saw that, it really struck a chord within me. I thought, how sad and unfortunate there's that many dads in prison. But let me just give you a quick history lesson. In 1985, there was about 110,000 men in prison across the U.S. Today, there's 3.5 million. In 1985, there was 90,000 children in daycare. Today, we're well over around 3 million today. My thought is this, and my belief is, as we looked at children as a curse instead of a blessing, we're reaping what we've sown. I may also add, since that time, God has opened many doors for us, and today we minister uh, throughout the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and California. <laughs> A couple of you got that. Uh, and uh, while we still go back and do prison ministry every year, we're very passionate about encouraging families in a setting like this, because you get a man saved in prison, that's wonderful, but he's still disconnected from his family. You know what I'm saying? And how much better if we could break the cycle before it ever gets there. So tonight... By the way, let me just tell you this right up front. If we hear a baby crying during the service, that is music to my wife and my ears. We love it, okay? It's great. Don't feel like you have to haul them off to nursery or something like that. And if you've got a child sitting in your lap or beside you, moms, dads, those were tomorrow's forefathers. Think about that. Big responsibility we have. We don't take it lightly. Amen? When my wife and I got married, the doctors told us we may never have any children. <laughs> yeah, oh my. Yeah, was he wrong? I said that to somebody a while back, and he said, well, you should have found a different doctor. But anyhow... You know, we are so blessed with the 10 children God has given you, and we'll take any blessing we can get. Who doesn't want the blessing tonight? I want every blessing God will give me. Lady to my left is my wife, Becky. Her and I have been married for 27 years, and I know many of you think she's my oldest daughter, but she really is my wife. I've got to tell you this story. This is a Texas story. We were either here a year ago or somewhere in this neck of the woods, and this sweet lady came up to me, and she said, Mr. Bontrager, I feel so sorry for you. And I said, what, why is that? She goes, well, you travel throughout the country with your 11 children and no wife. She said, that's got to be a real challenge. <laughs> but I assured her that this was not my oldest daughter. This is my wife, Becky. I'd like to introduce our oldest daughter, Chelsea. She is 26. She plays piano, guitar, and mandolin. She loves to write. She's a photographer, a great cook, and she is one of the most generous people I know. Mitchell's 24. He plays the banjo lead guitar and bass guitar. He arranges a lot of our music. He drives our bus and he preaches the word of God for us on Sunday mornings at our services Sunday mornings. And um, when we're not traveling, he's employed on the family farm and loves working there. And we are so thankful to have him in our family. This is my little sister, Allison. Allison is 22 and she plays the violin. When we're home, she enjoys cooking, gardening, landscaping, and working at our local hotel. And Allison is very passionate about discipling young ladies to live for the Lord. Well, I have the very special privilege of introducing my younger brother, Carson. He is 21 years old, and you can see he looks a little different. That's not because we forgot to buy him a suit, but he actually does not travel with us anymore, but just joined up with us today to spend a few days with us, so we're very excited to have him here. And he loves to hunt and farm and do mechanical work. He's a very good mechanic. He spends a lot of time working on tractors and equipment. And those are some of his favorite things to do. Joshua is 19. He plays dobro, guitar, banjo, and piano. He is a very great writer and writes some great articles on all kinds of things from a Christian worldview. He is currently uh, studying for a degree in communications. And when he's home on the farm, he does a great job hauling grain, milking cows, and helping out wherever else needed. Denver 17, he plays violin and mandolin. Denver loves hunting, trapping, fishing, gardening, driving tractor and four-wheeler, and doing anything else outdoors. He's also an avid reader. He absolutely loves playing chess. He really enjoys debating and discussing controversial topics. And he really loves Bible trivia. You know, Josh, if you're going to mention Bible trivia, I really need to ask you a question. Where is baseball mentioned in the Bible? Baseball? In the Bible? Or even in the same ballpark? Well, believe it or not, right in Genesis, it says, in the big inning. Oh. And Eve stole first and Adam stole second. Seriously. 
And, and well, Gideon, he rattled the pitchers. And Moses put forth his hand and caught it. But Moses, unfortunately, was a really bad hitter. And you know why? He struck out at the rock. You know, I got, I got some better than that. The Bible says, the righteous runneth into it and is safe. How about, yea, I will make men to walk? Well, I got the best one of all. You know, the prodigal son, he made a home run. <laughs> Taylor is 15. He plays banjo, piano, and bass. At home, he does a great job taking care of our calves and milking the cows, and he is passionate about memorizing God's word. This is my younger sister, Elizabeth. She is 13 years old and loves to play the piano and the violin. She is a great chef and fantastic artist, and she also loves to meet new people. This is Hudson. He is 11 years old, and he plays violin and bass. He enjoys reading and does a wonderful job feeding the calves at home on our farm, and he also likes playing chess and football with his brothers. This is the youngest member of our family, and her name is Rebecca. She is a songbird and a bookworm. She enjoys playing with dolls and riding bike, and she is 9 years old. This is Daddy. He is the best daddy in the whole world. He enjoys going on dates with Mommy, telling me stories, and playing ball with my brothers. He is the oldest member in our family, <laughs> and he plays the radio. <laughs> AM and FM, you bet. You know, I love going in the Old Testament, looking at some of those ways that God moved in a miracle, miraculous ways. For example, Daniel in the lion's den. You young children, do you know that story? Amazing. Daniel went into the lion's den, and he came out safe. Wasn't eaten alive or anything. But another one is when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea on dry land. Can you imagine that day, being part of that tribe, going through the Red Sea, big walls of water on both sides. If I'd have been a little kid that day, I'd want to take my finger and just kind of <laughs> poke out into that wall of water and see what would happen, you know? But let's not think God just did miracles back then. I'm here to encourage you. In 2017, we still serve a powerful God. God's word hasn't changed. God is still working in the lives of men and women today. And it's so easy, and we'll talk about this a little more later on, how it's very easy to get caught up in all the negativity and all the stuff that's going on in the culture around us that we forget what a great and awesome God we serve. If you know this next song and want to sing along with us, feel free to do so. <laughs> Becoming a flesh, and these are the days. 
days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation You know, when somebody calls you up and says, hey, let's go out for coffee, if it's somebody on the other end of the line that's a joyful person that you know will lift your spirits, it's very easy to say yes, or it's much easier, should I say, to say yes. But the question I have for you tonight, two questions. One is, are you a joyful person? Am I a joyful person? Any one of us can be joyful for a day or two or three if the circumstances are right, but true lasting joy, where does it come from? The Lord. The Lord. Amen. This is a t an old hymn I think you're going to recognize. And you, we're going to have our B team sing it for us tonight. Are you guys up to it? All right, we have what we call the A team, and then we bring out the B team, okay? So the B team's going to sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of Wow. 
evening, I'm so grateful for the gift of the Word of God. And I'm thankful that the Bible is truly unlike any other book ever written by men, because the Bible is the inspired words of God, and the Bible has the power to change my life and your life, if you'll allow it to. The Bible is such an incredible book, and we, we have so much of the Word of God. We have God's Word on our coffee tables, beside our beds, and even on our phones. Yet how much do we as Christians love the Word of God? It's all around us, but do we take time to read it and study it and memorize it and treasure it? So this evening, I challenge all of you to love the Word of God, to treasure it, because it's through knowing the Word of God that you will come to know the God of the Word in a deeper and more powerful way. And this evening, I'd like to share with all of you one of my favorite psalms, written by David, the great psalmist, the man after God's own heart. David wrote this psalm while in the wilderness, possibly while fleeing from his own son, Absalom. Yet it was in this time, this difficult time in David's life, that he realized how much he really needed the Lord. David realized that he needed to seek the face of God. He needed to know the face of God. This evening, I encourage all of you, no matter what you're going through, what you have gone through, what you will go through, I encourage you to seek and know the face of God. Because... That is a strength that will keep you going no matter what you face in life. So I pray the words of this psalm will be a blessing to you this evening. Psalm 63. The prayer of David, the man of God, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Psalm 63. God's word tells us that children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. 
But you know, those precious children, those blessings of God, grow up very, very quickly. And that time that we as parents have to bring them up in the nurture and admi admonition of the Lord is very short. And so tonight, we want to sing a song to encourage you to cherish every moment you have with those children. Use every opportunity to teach them about God, to read God's word with them, to pray with them, to play with them, to sing with them. And so tonight, as we sing this song, I hope you'll think about how you can cherish the moment with the children that God has given to you. <laughs> You know, grow up, growing up in a large family has definitely, be, uh, definitely been interesting. It's been a very good thing, but uh, one of the things we've learned over the years is that life goes a lot better when the girls cooperate. I mean, when everybody cooperates. And um, yes, it's uh, really a lot better that way. And you know, it's really like that in all of life, actually, if you stop and think about it, whether it's in your family or at uh, church, at work, no matter what we're doing in life, if we can't learn to cooperate and work together with other people, it's very difficult to get anything done. So we've worked up a song that just demonstrates uh, what you can get done when you learn to work together and get along with other people. And we call this song Sibling Cooperation. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. You know, we have found out over the years that that song only works when the girls cooperate. One of the things I want to really encourage you in tonight is we need to pass our faith on to the next generation. You might say, well, you might be sitting here and saying, well, we can't force Christianity on them. Well, let me put it this way. The world is forcing their agenda on them. So I think the least we can do, I want to challenge you tonight, let's tell our children and our grandchildren the great things that God has done for us, the greatest which would be when we got born again. Back in 1987, I remember that January evening. See, I grew up in a Christian home. Went to church every Sunday, but often on Friday and Saturday nights, I would be out drinking and partying with my friends. And I remember living a very two-faced life, but I was always worried about what would happen if I were to die. And I remember that night I got saved. I went to bed that evening and had a peace like I never had before. You could say a peace that many of you know I'm talking about passes all understanding. My sins are covered by the blood because of what Christ did on the cross. Your sins are too. It's the sins of the world are covered by the blood, but it's a free gift. We have to accept that gift or get to accept that gift. It's not for a couple select predestinated few. It's for anybody. It's a free gift. It really is. And so I want to encourage you tonight, if you're born again, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, sometimes, we okay back there, by the way? It's not about banjo players. They just want to be heard, okay? <laughs> just, just get it out of your system. There's a little room back there you can go into for a while, okay? Anyhow, just having a real serious point. Now I lost my train of thought. Anyhow, where I'm going with this is take time in the next week to sit down with your son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter and say, I would like to tell you my testimony. Tell them about how it was that you got born again. What? He's still going at it. Now a different one. See what I put up with, guys? It's all good. This is called Covered by the Blood. <laughs> The banjo player. He's either tuning or playing himself out of tune. Have you guys ever heard about the difference between a banjo and a trampoline? Anyone ever heard about that? Well, you see, when you're going to jump on the trampoline, you always make sure to take your shoes off.
Today in America, it seems like so many have forgotten what truth really is. But this evening, I want to remind all of you that truth is not based on popular opinion. Truth is found in the Word of God. And now is the time when we need Christians who are willing to stand up and live their lives by the Word of God, regardless of the consequences. Today, it is a time for truth. I remember how it used to be without any hypocrisy when the church of God shined just like brightly. When a man was not afraid to sacrifice for the Christ who died to give him life, even if it cost him everything. When pastors proclaimed the truth of God's word, fighting for life before birth, and marriage as God planned it to be. Though things have changed so drastically, it's time we stand for what we believe. It's a time for truth. We will stand for what is right. It's a time for truth. We will not give up the fight. It's a time for truth. We will not give up the fight. We will live our lives every day by God's word that does not change. It's a time for truth. They despise the truth we say, but still we'll stand firm and proclaim it every day. For our lives are not filled on ship and sand, but on the word of God we'll stand. It's a time for truth. We will stand for what is right. It's a time for truth. We will not give up the fight. We will live our lives every day by God's word that does not change. It's time for truth. Ooh. Oh, we will stand and fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. We will hold to the right in the power of his might. For his truth marches on and it will overcome no matter what the world It's a time for truth. We will stand for what is right. It's a time for truth. We will not give up the fight. We will live our lives every day by God's word that does not change. It's a time for truth. It's a time for truth. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Stand ye in the way, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You know, the good thing about that verse is that even though it was written several thousand years ago, it still applies just as much today as it did when it was written, because the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word never has changed, and it's never going to change really doesn't matter what changes around us as long as we have our lives anchored in the Word of God. And in 2017, it is still a great thing to be called an old-fashioned Christian. I work for it, and every job I do, I do with pride. I believe in keeping a promise that I make, you got my word on it. When I shake your hand and look you in the eye, I believe in my country, 
And putting your hand over your heart And taking off your hat when that anthem starts Call me old fashioned, call me out of touch Or having faith in the way it was When mom and pop was a place we shot And a check was good for cashing Call me out of style, that's who I am when a neighbor's down, I reach out my hand I just can't turn my head and walk right past him Call me Walk, ears that can listen and 
And as it can see, well, I've got to praise Him as long as I breathe, because I have been blessed. A father and mother nurtured and raised, my sisters and brothers with memories made. Our pastor to lead us, his altar to pray, strength that can heal and the blood that still saves. I have been blessed. live in a country, the greatest on earth, with the flags and for freedom and what it is worth. She stands in the harbor, this liberty calls. All gave some, but some gave it all for me to be blessed. that we live in the time and the place when it is easier than it's ever been to be a Christian. It really doesn't cost us very much. We can go to church without worrying about getting hauled off to jail. We can share our faith, most places in this country still without any fear. But with that freedom also comes a great danger, and the danger is to be apathetic, selfish, lazy Christians. And I know that I have been guilty far too often. So I just want to encourage each one of us this evening to step back and look at our lives. Are we really being radical followers of Jesus Christ, taking up our cross and following him? Or are we more worried about our comfort and pleasure and popularity? Do we really look for those people in our lives that we can reach for him?
not ashamed to live our whole life long and stand before our God. Before what our a God. daddy it would be to hear him say these words. Near the ones who could have breathed. He's the light you should have. In Luke 15, Jesus tells the familiar story of the shepherd who had 100 sheep but lost one. And as we know, that shepherd, because he loved that sheep, left the fold and searched for that sheep until he found it. And in so many ways, the shepherd in that story is a picture of the great shepherd, Jesus. And if you're here this evening and you have never met Jesus, the great shepherd, then you two are lost, like that poor little lost lamb. And you're destined to spend an eternity in hell unless you repent and trust in Christ. But if you know Jesus, the great shepherd, if he's your Savior and Lord, then you can rejoice in his great salvation. So Jesus ended that story with these words. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And just like Jesus said, we know that every time a sinner comes to know the Savior, there is shouting time in heaven. <laughs> It's shouting time in heaven, a sinner was lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven, salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know my sins have been covered by the crimson flow, and now I feel it fine. I'm walking on the highway built by love, my name's written down in the porch of love. It's shouting time in heaven, oh yes, it's shouting time. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of Christ my Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. It's shouting time in heaven. A sinner was lost is found. It's shouting time in heaven. Salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know my sins have been covered with the crimson flow. And now I feel it fine. I'm walking on the highway, built by love, my name's written down in Heavy laden, bruised and battered by the fall. 
you're better, you will never come at all. It is shout found in heaven, a sinner once lost his found. It shout found in heaven, salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know my sins have been covered with a crimson foe, and now I'm feeling fine. I'm walking down the highway built by love, my name's written down the courts above. It's shout found in heaven, oh yes, it's shout and time. It's shout found in heaven, oh yes, it's shout and time. It's shout and time in heaven, a sinner was lost his found. It's shout and time in heaven, salvation has been brought down. No wonder the angels rejoice to know my sins have been covered by the crimson foe, and now I'm feeling fine. I'm walking on the highway, built by love, my name's written down in the courts above. It's shout and time in heaven, oh yes, it's shout and time. It's shout and time in heaven. Oh yes, it's shout and time. Yes, it's shout and time. Over 100 years ago, William Booth said that the greatest dangers facing the coming century would be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And sadly, we have seen every one of those things come true in our modern day culture. But I want to encourage each and every one of you that as Christians, we have a duty to give our best for the one who died for us. So as we go forth from this place, I want to encourage all of you to always remember to stand up for Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Much easier said than done, right? It's very easy to sing and get all excited about standing up for Jesus, but when Monday morning rolls around and you're in the workforce and your fellow workers are talking about, maybe they're making a, a lewd joke or something, 
how easy is it to laugh along with them rather than taking a stand and say, hey, we shouldn't be talking like that. I'm just, thought just came to me just kind of out of nowhere just now. But I want to share a story with you. April 18, 1775, the British had their troops in old Boston. And the plans were at nighttime to cross the St. Charles River and to attack at Concord and Lexington. The New, New England countryside, I can picture that night in a state of slumber, fast asleep. Moms had taken their little children to bed and probably blown out the candles and said their goodnight prayers. You could say everybody was asleep except for one man in particular. His name was Paul Revere. As he went throughout the New England countryside that night, he shouted, wake up, wake up, for the British are coming, the British are coming. And as you think of that, you might say, what's that got to do with anything tonight? Well, I don't claim to be Paul Revere, but I'm doing whatever I can, and we, our family is doing whatever we can to sound the alarm in America. We're at a crossroads in our nation. And in some ways, you could say we're beyond the crossroads, okay? We're like over the cliff, hanging on by a thread. But I don't want to be all doom and gloom tonight. And just, but I think sometimes to really, I have to kind of share the facts before I can just up and give you a word of encouragement. But as I was thinking about the last couple months that we've been traveling, what is it that it seems many good, well-meaning Christians are missing out on? Maybe myself included. Because it seems, that first of all, it's a blessing tonight to be here and see all these children and young people here tonight. This is encouraging. If you would ask our family, this is a bit rare. It really is. And so I'm encouraged by that. So moms and dads keep pressing on. But I still believe that one of the things that we're lacking in America, in our culture today, it's very easy to look at the White House and say, well, they're going to fix it. And we heard the slogan in the last year, making America great again. Folks, we can't make America great again because we never made it great to begin with. If it was good, it was because of God made it good. Amen? Amen? And so tonight, I think one of the things that's been coming to me lately is Ecclesiastes 12, 13. You know, Solomon at the very end of his life, the wisest man that ever lived. Think about what he said at the closing chapter of his life. He said, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is the whole duty of man. Fear God. And I know this, uh, Webster says the fear of God or fear is meaning you have an awe and a respect of something. A couple weeks ago on a Sunday, we were in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Franklin, St Franklin Street Baptist Church, Pastor Terry Gore. And Brother Gore was telling me over lunch that day of what's going on in the city of Jacksonville. He said they just passed an ordinance where the LGBTQ community said you can go into any restroom you want, male or female, school system, any public restrooms. It's open game for everyone wants to go wherever they want. He said, yes, shame is right. The disturbing thing he said is there was 21 city council members. Of the 21 city council members, 13 voted in favor to pass this. What might shock you is the 13 that voted in favor for it, all 13 go to church on Sunday. All 13. And so I've been thinking about that. And he was going to go in the following week along with a couple of their pastors. And he was going to go in and talk to them. And the question he was going to ask him is, first of all, are you born again? Do you, have, do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? And then if you're born again, why is there such a disconnect between what your actions say? First of all, I doubt if they're born again, but that God will judge. Why is there such a disconnect between that and their actions? And I like to, when I pick up a book, I like to, my family jokes about it, Dad kind of reads the foreword and he reads the last chapter and the book's done. But I have found out the last chapter of a book says a lot about the book. And so I was just looking, I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you tonight in 1 Timothy. You don't have to turn to it if you don't want, but Paul was speaking to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 11, and this is to exhort and encourage you. He sp it says, but thou, man of God, flee these things and fall after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of, on eternal life. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 8, and I'm just going to read this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traity, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Jumping ahead to chapter 4, he goes on and says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. 
for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but shall after their own but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Faith. Tonight I want to challenge you as a group of people. Let's be fighters. Let's fight the good fight of faith. Seriously, I want to encourage you. It's very easy. If you read enough newspaper, watch enough TV, you can think there's no hope out there, and you start letting your guard down. But there's a couple things in that passage that jumped out at me, and I just jot them out down to be encouragement to you tonight. Be instant in season and out of season. One of those things I think it could mean is whether you feel like it or you don't feel like it, do right anyhow, okay? Do right anyhow. You know, those, co those, those uh, councilmen over there, I, I don't know if they're saved or not, but do right anyhow, no matter what the pressure is. Another one is reprove and rebuke. In our culture today, that's the opposite of being politically correct, okay? Reprove and rebuke. If you need to reprove somebody, do it in love. Don't just, you know, use tact, but go to them in love and say, hey, brother, I think you may be off course a little bit here. Hey, sister, did you think about this? But do it with relationship and do it with grace. But don't be scared to reprove and rebuke. And then exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Goes on to say, watch in all things. You know, watching in all things. I have a friend that uh, he, he read a book a while back on the FBI and what the FBI looks for. And uh, he told me that he was encouraging me a while back and he'd be aware of my surroundings wherever I go. So we were in Hattiesburg, Mississippi the other day. And I shared this with my family. So my family is starting to be more, more aware of their surroundings. So you don't know, by the way, what all we've been noticing about you tonight. I'm just kidding. But anyhow, we were in Hattiesburg, Mississippi and sitting in a Walmart parking lot with our bus the other day having family devotions. And the shades were up in our, in our bus. And one of my daughters interrupted me. I think I was reading the scripture. She interrupted me. She goes, Dad, you won't believe what I'm seeing. I said, what are you seeing? She said, there's a guy trying to break into vehicles out here at Walmart parking lot. And I said, you got to be kidding. Sure enough, we look out the window, and there's this guy. He's going from car to car. He just looks around and feels the door, and it's locked. He moves on to the next one, okay? And my carnal nature, I'm, you might think I'm super spiritual, but my carnal nature was actually hoping he would break into one so we could do some heroic arrest of some sort. I don't know what. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Every car he went to was locked. But uh, anyhow, be, be on guard. Be watching your surroundings. That story, you can take it or leave it how you want. But I'm just saying, be watchful. But on a serious note, on a spiritual note, moms, dads, watch. What kind of things are affecting our young people? What kind of things are, are they affecting them? You know, this can be a blessing and it can be a curse. It can be a blessing. It's derailing many, many young people today. It really is. If you're going to let your children have an iPhone, make sure you know or have a way of knowing what sites are going to. And unfortunately, in today's culture, most young people are smarter than mom and dad and can figure out ways to get around it. So you need to be diligent. You need to be vic victorious in that area. Um, endure afflictions. Endure afflictions, he says. And I think when I was thinking about that, one of the things that came to me, I have met in our travels a lot of people that harbor a lot of bitterness over the silliest things. And I remember years ago, I was traveling to Wisconsin on a business trip. I was about 30 years old. And I was about two hours from home, and I started thinking back. My dad died when I was 18, and right after he died, a couple of the ministers from our church, and I was not living for the Lord, they came to me and talked to me. And instead of coming to me and talking to me about, hey, hey, brother, we're sorry your dad passed away. How you doing? Right the, we, we grew up in a, it was, it was a conservative Mennonite setting, and that's kind of irrelevant except for the point is in that setting, there's a lot of rules and regulations with outward conformity, okay? A lot of rules without application. And anyhow, they came to me and talked to me about some of those things, and I got really bitter as a young man. Well, I remember going home on that business trip. I was about 30 years old, and my mind started going back and thinking about that, something that happened 15 years prior. Literally, I'm a grown man. I'm married and have five, six children at home, and I started bawling and weeping. Poor me. How I was so mistreated by these ministers. You know what? Marlon, let it go. Let it go. Move on. And bitterness, endure a few afflictions, okay? Endure a few afflictions. I'm 49, fixing to be 50 soon, and uh, fixing, that's how they say it in the South, okay? <laughs> fixing to be 50 soon. Um, the South is wearing off on me. But I um, met an inmate in South Carolina a couple weeks ago, 65-year-old man, 
He's been behind bars 40 years, and he said, I just got saved last year. And I said, just got saved last year. Why not quicker? And he says, well, to be honest, I've been bitter about my childhood all these years, and I could not come to reconciliation with that. 40 years in prison, harboring bitterness. Can you imagine the bondage? I say that tonight, so Christians, we get offended so easily, so easily. And I'm preaching to myself. Let let things roll off our back, okay? We need to be positive and have the light of the light of what Christ has given us. The scriptures are powerful. They are for they are for today. And I think sometimes we think, well, that was some some good piece of literature back then. No, folks. It's for a lost and dying world, and we're supposed to be the salt and light. I guess the point I want to make is I want to hear good words on Judgment Day. What do I mean by good words? I want to hear words like, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to close with this story, and this is kind of to encourage you mom and dads to make those tough decisions that are very hard sometimes, but if you know it's the right decision to make and you know God's word backs it up, by all means, stand up and do it. Years ago, in 1924, there was an American by the name of Bill Havens. Bill Havens was a very gifted athlete and was going to compete in an event that year called the Canadian Singles Rowing Event. In January that year, prior to Olympics being held in August, he found out that his wife was pregnant due right at Olympic time. So, in his book, A Life of No Regrets, Bill Havens wrote, I decided to forego my only chance of a gold medal and stay home at my wife's side. Time went on and Americans forgot about Bill Havens. But in 1952, he got a telegram from Paris, France, where the Olympics were that year. And the telegram said like this, it said, Dear Dad, thanks for waiting around for me in 24. I'm coming home with the gold medal you should have won, your loving son, Frank. True story, and we love stories like that, but the truth be known, your sons and daughters, my sons and daughters may never win a gold medal in the Olympics. They may never get the opportunity to even play violin or piano in front of anybody. That really doesn't matter. What really matters is if on Judgment Day, they hear those words, well, good, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not to depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And I'm afraid we've got way too many children, way too many people, I'm sorry, way too many people going through life having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know, my children and I have a fair bit of time to talk as we're on the road, and one of the things one of the boys was saying the other day, he goes, Dad, do you really think as many people as we meet in churches, a vast number of them are saved? And I said, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. I hope every one of you tonight is saved and is living a victorious Christian life. I hope so. But I'm also not so ignorant to know that in a room this size, the odds are pretty slim. That's true, Okay. And, you know, before I go on a tour of any sort, and we travel six months of the year, I have a mechanic back home that goes over a bus from front to back, all over. We do a mechanical evaluation. Tonight, we're going to do a spiritual evaluation. We want you just to bow your heads. And no looking around tonight. And if tonight if the Lord is speaking to you, and you're saying, I do not know for certain. I do not know for certain where my eternal destiny is. I've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. It's not that difficult, friend. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do it like I did back in 1987 when I went to the altar and just knelt there and said, Lord, I want You. Forgive me my sins. I want to trust in You. I want to surrender my life to serve You. Would you wash me clean? If there's anybody here tonight who'd like to just come to the altar tonight and get that right with God, please do. I know pastor's here. He would love to pray with you. I would love to and open the scriptures. But maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know what? I may not have 40 years of bitterness that I'm harboring, but I've got an awful lot. I need to come put it at Jesus' feet tonight. Whatever it may be. Maybe a marriage that's struggling. Maybe you need to come to the altar as a family. I don't know what it is. Why don't you all just stand and keep in a spirit of prayer. Stand up as we, as we have this invitation. And would you just come to the altar tonight and do business with God if the Lord is speaking to you this evening. Eternity is forever and ever. And there's an all-out assault on the last days. Satan is doing everything he can to destroy families. He knows time is short. But I'm not going to give up without fighting. Let's fight the good fight.
anyone want to do business with God tonight, just come up front. We'd love to have pray with you. Dear Lord, the most important question that is to be answered in this room before we leave is whether or not we're saved. And God, if your spirit is working on a heart today, God, I pray that you'll continue to pester them, you'll continue to be with them, Lord, and show them the need to repent of their sin, ask forgiveness, and draw close to you. Lord, I pray that you'll work in their lives. In your name we pray. You may have a seat. Let's uh, thank the Bontrager family again, if you will. We appreciate your testimony and uh, the music and the message as well, brother. Thank you so much for that. We're going to go ahead and take an, uh, uh, an offering up at this time. So if I could have our gentlemen come forward. Uh, all the money that is collected will go to the Bontrager family to help them as they travel. Um, remember, this is not the time to put your tithe in there, okay? Save that. Give that to one of the ushers, but this is for the Bontrager family. Gentlemen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, what our ears have heard tonight, Lord, uh, how this family is uh, standing uh, up for what they believe in and, and not afraid to share it. We ask that uh, as they have stood uh, without being ashamed, Lord, may we be inspired to do the same thing in our everyday lives. Uh, they can go to different places that we cannot go, Lord, but you placed us where you placed us, and I pray that we would stand for you. Uh, let us not be concerned about what people will say about us, Lord, but let us be concerned about what you say about us, and Lord, because you are the final say in everything. We also pray that as we uh, take up this offering that we consider this family, Lord, and consider the, the different trials they may have on the road, Lord, and may we contribute to helping them and sending them on their way. We pray also that if we've been blessed by them, Lord, let us show our appreciation in what we give. We ask that as we leave this place, Lord, as you give us all safety, Lord, help us to leave this place a changed people, a people inspired to stand up for what is right. And let us not just uh, uh, take anything that, that is the flavor of the month, Lord, but let us uh, say, go by thus saith the Lord. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. just want to make brief mention of a couple of resources we have out in the foyer that I think can be an encouragement to the family. One is a book I came across in the last year by Paul Chappell, Making Homework in a Broken Society. Powerful, powerful book. Obviously, nothing is better than God's Word, but if you're a parent, you still have children in your home, I would highly encourage you to pick one of these up. And I love this little book called The Bible ABCs. There is a verse for every letter of the alphabet. I've always loved reading to my children. I re still read to the younger ones, and... Um, it's just a wonderful way to connect to your children and to give them truth. And what better truth than God's word? So with each um, verse, there's also a little devotional. And there's wonderful um, pictures in this. And little children, even young children, enjoy this. I remember when Rebecca was two, I found a book kind of like this at a garage sale. And I started reading it to her. And by the time she was three, she had memorized every verse. And I'd also like to tell you about a brand new season of the Bible Bee Game Show that's going to be airing on April 4th 
on FaceTime Live. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can tell I don't do Facebook, right? No. Facebook Live. Anyway, I think that you all will love watching it. There's going to be 72 young people, ages 7 through 18, who have memorized up to 900 verses of scripture, and they're going to be competing for prizes up to $100,000. And um, I think you'll love watching that and invite your friends to join you. And this, um, each episode will be, will share the gospel message and the power of God's word. We also have our five CDs back on our table. One is a children's CD that my five youngest siblings did, and the other four are family albums. And then our most recent project we'll be releasing in a couple weeks here, Lord willing. And if you would like information when that comes out, you can sign up for our email newsletter back on our table. Quite a few of the songs we sang here tonight will be on that album, and we're really excited to be releasing that soon. So sign up if you want to get information when that comes out. We have our prayer cards back there. They are free. Um, please help yourself to those as you're leaving tonight, and remember to pray for us. That would be a blessing to our family. If you want to stay in touch with us, you can visit our website, bontierfamilysingers.com, and click on the blog tab at the top. We post a lot of updates and pictures, both as we're out on tour and also home on the farm. We are also on Instagram, bontierfamilysingers, if you want to follow us there and um, keep up with our life, and our music is also available on iTunes. These resources are available on a donation basis, and my wife and I have decided that 100% of the proceeds would go to feed hungry children. <laughs> <laughs> the church fed us a phenomenal meal, though, in spite of, uh, speaking of hungry, they fed us a great meal tonight. Thank you, church. We're always involved. That was, that was really great. I uh, want to make one announcement, too. If you think about it, this coming Friday, we'll be going into Mexico for about two and a half weeks. And just keep us in your prayers as we have various services around Mexico, Chihuahua State, and down by Durango. And just covet your prayers. You, you, many of you, if you're in Texas, you know the situation in Mexico. I'm not telling you anything new. And also, if you're here tonight and you heard my message and you about the importance of being born again, and you do not know, don't put it off. I plead with you. We got an email a couple days ago. Uh, from a lady in Fort Worth that had come to one of our concerts three years ago. And she went home that evening and uh, couldn't sleep and got up during the night and knelt beside her bed and accepted Christ as a personal Savior and finally emailed us three years later and told us about it. But I say that to you to just don't put it off. But if you do get saved, tell somebody. Tell Pastor here, Pastor David, or tell somebody. It's so vitally important. And do not put it off. We're going to do a final song, and Pastor, I'll turn it over to you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And let's all stand, and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for the Bontrager family and their testimony and their talent that they use for the Lord. And God, I pray that you'll be with them as they travel to Mexico. God, I pray that you'll put a hedge of protection around their family. Lord, allow them to uh, be a great influence in, uh, in Monterey where they're going. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with us. Dismiss us with your love. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we ask all, the, all these things in your name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>